epilepsy was thought to be only going one way where the receptors were inactivated so there was no inhibition and then whoa then you would have seizures but that's what we were doing in this study that actually not only losing the functionality of these receptors that are binding to GABA will lead to epilepsy actually the opposite is possible as well. Fellow homo sapiens welcome to or welcome back to Epilepsy Sparks Insights. Did you know that people with the same genetic mutation can have different outcomes. I mean, who knew that a slight variation in an amino acid of our central nervous system or a GABA receptor could send our brains massively out of whack, causing some people to have horrifically uncontrollable seizures, intellectual disability, movement disorders, and increased mortality. That same mutation could also cause a person to have treatable epilepsy and regular intelligence. This week, neuroscientist Nazanin tells us all about her research into the clinical and functional characterization of GABA receptors and how symptoms can vary so, so much. Please don't forget to share your thoughts on this episode with us in the comments below. I really enjoy the comments and responding to them. They're fabulous. And make sure that you do subscribe so that we can educate and empower both more people affected by the epilepsies and indeed more clinicians with patients who have an epilepsy so that they can provide the best care possible. My name is uh, Nazanin and I have uh, a few months ago defended my PhD. So, and I have been working on uh, epilepsy genetics and some laboratory work and clinical correl uh, correlation analysis. So that's what I have been doing the last three and a half years actually. So yeah, but now, I'm, now I have just time to relax a bit after the PhD. So it's really nice. So what was the title of your PhD? Or maybe if it's simpler, what were you actually studying? Yeah, actually the title is very long, but I can read it from my thesis. It's not really okay, go on then. easy to remember. <laughs> Are you ready for the long title? <laughs> go for it. Clinical mm -hmm. and Functional Characterization of GABA-A Receptor Related Disorders, Translating Genetic Diagnostics into Personalized Treatment. So basically, I was working with the um, genetic mutations in the GABA-A receptor subunits and how it was causing epilepsy and other com comorbidities in different patients. So, And just for people who aren't familiar with um, GABA receptors, could you just give us a little breakdown of, of what they are and what they do, please? They are uh, receptors in our CNS, of course, uh, in our brain. And they, were, they are responsible for inhibitory signals. So they're activated by the neurotransmitter GABA, which is inhibitory. So actually understanding how mutations in this uh, receptor can lead to epilepsy was thought to be only going one way where the receptors were inactivated. So there was no inhibition and then, whoa, then you would have seizures. But that's what we were doing in this study that actually not only losing the functionality of these receptors that are binding to GABA will lead to epilepsy. Actually, the opposite is possible as well. So that's the main result of my thesis, actually. You can go one way or the other. You can have too much or too little, and each of those things can lead to seizures. Exactly. And that was amazing to understand that it doesn't, it doesn't have just one function, these variants. So these mutations, are they inherited from parents or are they um, mutations in their child themselves? Uh, the majority I worked with in this cohort in my own study was, many of them weren't de novo ones, so it was just happened in the child. But uh, we also had few cases where it was inherited, but in my study, the functional outcome was neutral. It can be both inherited or that it's de novo, but if your parents had it and they also were equally sick, then if you inherited this, this, the same mutation, of course, it's pathogenic, but sometimes when it's familial, sometimes it can be less pathogenic. Yeah, but usually de novo ones are the worst ones. The type of uh, people in your study, they were all children, was that correct? Yes, majority of them were children, at least when the mutations were detected in their system <laughs> if they were children but uh, now that after so many years that i went back and looked at the papers that were published some years ago some of them were not children anymore but the data that i was looking at were 
from vulnerable children. I only ask that because much of the time we um, hear about the mutations in in babies and children, and often I think because you know, life expectancy isn't necessarily, mm. you know, overly high. But um, so it's interesting to hear that there are some adults, people who have grown up. Um, and lived to the later years still with this mutation. I think that was a very interesting point because a lot of parents would also ask us in the hospital, uh, like, how's the future for our kids having this mutation? So we also didn't have like clear picture before, but now after doing the study, at least we have a spectrum of very mild ones and very severe ones. And then you have some survivors as well in the mild cases. Then you have like overview. If you have this, you might live as well and you might go to school and have a normal life. But then it depends on which symptoms you have, of course, if it's very mild or in the middle. But now we have like overview of that you don't die of this mutation necessarily. And you can also have a normal, semi-normal life living with this mutation. So now we can answer some of the questions. I think that's an interesting point because lot, not, lots of people, so in some clinicians too, um, will assume that if two people have the same mutation, then their symptoms will be identical. But that's not always the case, is it? It can, there can be a lot of variance within the same mutation. You're right about it. Uh, we had one case that um, the amino acid residue um, at the one position, so it was changed to different amino acids at one position, it's the same position, but it was changed from one to another and from the same to whole another amino acid residue. And the results was one of them were neutral and there was no effect according to my uh, measurements. So it didn't hyperactive the receptor neither making it not function at all. But uh, the other one that changed from the same to whole another amino acid in the same position, it had another effect. So you can even have the same mutation spot, but changing it to different amino acids can also change the symptoms in the patients and the clinical picture actually. Which I guess shows more and more research is required to further understand why do some people experience some, some symptoms and why do some people not? Exactly. Exactly. So it's very individual according to which position and which amino acid is substituted with what. So it's very dependent on what you have and it really needs to be tested. But of course, we know that it's not always available for the clinicians to test each individual of these variants. But as we are testing more and other people in different countries are testing more, so more variants are being tested and it will just contribute to developing some prediction tools. So that can at least be helpful. And the results of your work, are they going to be, or are they already useful in different spheres, like different types of epilepsies or one particular epilepsy diagnosis? The main part of my studies and the results, they are just published actually, and uh, I have shared, shared it uh, on my social media. So actually that part is going to be very useful for the patients who will be diagnosed or are diagnosed with the GABA B2 gene, which encodes one subunit of this GABA receptor. So um, I was mainly working on this uh, gene and it's going to be helpful for people being diagnosed with this specific gene so that maybe I have already done the functional testing on some of the variants. So clinicians can directly go and look at the effects, if it's a loss of function, if it's a gain of function and how it will, it will be in the future for the kid or adult or a teenager with this mutation. What is the progression and how the disease is going to look like? So it can actually be translated uh, and used in the clinics, actually. So I'm happy about that part. That's cool. And internationally. And how common is this variant? I will say it's very rare if we look at the rare diseases. So in our cohort, I had uh, 42 patients, but uh, it wasn't the all patients we had available. So in our database, we had around 70 something patients from whole world. So cool. I would say it's kind of rare, but um, rare diseases also need attention. So 
Oh, no, totally. And do you know what? I, I, I think sometimes from talking to lots of amazingly educated people like yourself is I, I wonder how many people may have these variants, but because they're, for example, because their symptoms may not be obvious, they mm -hmm. might be limited or because they're from a rural area or whatever it might be, we, you know, they might not be on the system. And so I, I don't know, what do you think about that? Do you think that there are potentially lots more people than we currently realise with, for instance, this mutation amongst others? Yeah, that's a very nice point, Tori. I think right now there might be way more people with this mutations in this specific gene. But of course, like genetic testing is not available in many countries still. So a lot of them are not even being tested and diagnosed with this genetic uh, mutation. And also, like as you said, often it's children who are diagnosed and this new technology are used to diagnose them. So a lot of, I feel at least the adults are missing in the system somehow. So they are not diagnosed or they are not getting this opportunity because now they are adults, they know how to manage life somehow and let's help the children. I also understand that part, but this sad reality makes it like harder for us to understand exactly how many people in the world are suffering from this uh, mutation in this gene. But I think there's way more and we will discover more patients with this mutation. But right now it's just limited. I think maybe after some few years, we will see how many more people are being diagnosed. It was, you've made me think of this time, it was actually at one of the DICE conferences in in Denmark. By the way, everyone check out DICE conference, amazing. Our next one is in two years time. I'll put the link below. Um, and there was one uh, person there who was a, a patient with the rare, one of the, I don't know if it was SCN2A or SCN8A, and he was a data scientist. And um, he stood out because, I, all the other, well, at least all the other people that I'd met there with one of these mutations, they were um, cognitively not nearly as functional, shall we say, as himself. Yeah. Like they were nonverbal yeah. or in, and often in wheelchairs and had other serious morbidities. And so I just thought that was a pretty wild example of how um, different mutations can affect different people differently. With the patients in this cohort, I didn't have... I had some patients that were very mild and then going to school and continuing life as like we other people do without this disease, but then some that were dying within four years of life. So it was like very wide symptom spectrum, but um, we had people with other uh, mutations. They were affected differently. Not even only the mutation itself is enough to determine how you're doing with the disease. Other factors such as environment or epigenetics and all these things could be contributing because it can be possible that exact the same mutation in one family can be so mild and so severe, but also epigenetic part plays a role. So I think it's very hard. It's like an onion with many rings. So you can keep on revealing. But yeah, it's very complicated, yeah. Isn't this like a perfect example of the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know, right? Exactly. Then you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't say anything because I don't know enough compared to some others. But yeah, then you realize how complicated things are. Yeah, that's true. This is really inspiring. And I, and I hope that um, somebody gets the opportunity to take, uh, to further this research into this mutation because yeah. obviously it's going to benefit the people with the mutation, which will no doubt be more people in the future, but their families as well. Um, and, you know, if anybody from any governments are listening, it benefits you too, because if you can get people, you know, having, uh, who are more well, more easily, it's going to be cheaper for you. So, you know, invest more in research. Exactly. That's our uh, <laughs> word for today. Actually, yeah, especially rare diseases, because families are just suffering in the silence, I feel. and. I know some other diseases like cancer or cardiovascular diseases, they are also very horrible diseases, but all sick people need the same attention. And not just because some more people, portion of more, a bigger portion of people are suffering from one, shouldn't be the reason that 
we are not getting paid enough attention for the others. Thank you so much to Nazanin for educating us of the complexities of GABA receptors and for sharing with us how a genetic mutation can so simply and significantly alter our neurological, psychiatric and cognitive function. Do check out Nazanin's paper and more about her work on the website toriwilkinson.com where you can also access the podcast, the video and the transcription of this episode. And if you haven't already, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to the channel, share this episode with your friends, colleagues, family members and see you next week.